I do not suggest that these developments are unprecedented in human history. You can see the same problems arising in the first years of the first great corporation in modern Europe, the Dutch East Indies Company. When the company was set up in 1602, it already had 1,143 subscribers in Amsterdam alone. Within five years, uh, nearly a third of the original stock had been transferred to new owners and they had to build a stock exchange to cope with these, um, this, this rapid um, turnover in, in shares. And soon, discontented shareholders were complaining both about their lack of dividends and about their lack of control over the directors and the captains of their faraway trading fleets. These unhappy investors were, were dubbed the Doleanti, and they put out pamphlets moaning about the self-serving governments of certain directors and the lack of transparency, which meant that all remained darkness in the accounts. In the end, the Dolly Anton actually succeeded. And when the company's charter was renewed 20 years later, 1622, nine wise men from among the shareholders were appointed as a supervisory board to approve company strategy, to sign off its accounts, and to nominate new directors, all the sort of things which we think would be terrifically good if they happened here, um, a, a model for what we now call corporate governance. Actually, what seems to have modified the Dolly Anthem in the end was the steady flow of dividends, which began as soon as the Dutch, East, uh, Dutch Navy had really got control of the East Indies. Nor is our own century the first to suffer from self-interested and predatory financial institutions. You may recall that Sir Fred Goodwin, in his heyday, boasted that the Royal Bank of Scotland would come to be feared as, quote, the greatest predator of all. Well, exactly what you want for bank, but that's more that as attractive as. Little now remains of Fred the Shred, his only monument is his enormous pension pot, and his only epitaph is his signature on a few old uh, Royal Bank of Scotland notes, which is still in circulation. I got one from a, a bar coming down from Edinburgh the other day. But uh, and here it is, there's, a, there's uh, Fred's signature as group chief executive, a signature which is as careless and headlong as everything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but next to him, there's a fine engraving of a shrewd-looking gentleman in a full-bottomed wig. This is Archibald Campbell, the Old Isla, the first chairman of the Royal Bank, and the crony of that brilliant and mercurial man who brought the Banque bon Royale in Paris to its knees by, as a result of the Mississippi bubble, 1720, by issuing too much paper money. It's something familiar there. Law and Isla were great financial innovators. They, they invented that ingenious device, the overdraft which has come to our rescue so often, <laughs> but they were also dodgy and unscrupulous characters. And Ida saw it his mission in life to obliterate RBS's rival, the older Bank of Scotland, and secure for himself a monopoly of issuing <coughs> bank notes. So Fred and Ida are brothers under the skin, uh, separated by, by nearly 300 years. The hazards of our form of capitalism and its vulnerability to the distortions of monopoly and outright looting are not entirely new, therefore. But what is new, I think, in the, is the pervasiveness of the limited joint stock company. In the early days of the Dutch East Indies Company, or the Royal Bank of Scotland, and in the centuries that followed, the economy was made up of half a dozen different types of organizations. There were signal owners of farms and mines and factories and landed estates. There were partnerships in professional undertakings, lawyers, GPs, publishers, banks, stockbrokers, and so on. There were family firms. There were mutual and cooperative enterprises, and many variants of these, both large and small. The joint stock companies were certainly powerful, especially from the mid-19th century when they began to enjoy legal, uh, legally limited liability. <coughs> they were not so universal or so dominant as then as they are today. In fact, it is only very recently that what is now called the PLC model became so ubiquitous, taking over building societies and other mutual financial institutions, remodeling the old partnership of professional men 
and invading public and or charitable bodies such as schools and hospitals. Many charities have grown enormous trading arms, the managers of which enjoy huge salaries. Look at the extraordinary saga of the Colonial Development Corporation, founded by the Acne government as a philanthropic enterprise to assist farmers in the poorest countries of the empire. After being privatized by Tony Blair, it is today a, a massive private equity fund which seeks out the most profitable investment opportunities across the world, not usually in agriculture at all, <coughs> and usually in the richer rather than the poorer countries of the Commonwealth, and which naturally dishes out uh, um, quite handsome rewards to the top managers who have engineered this transformation. But um, meanwhile, the institutions of old fashioned liberal capitalist democracy continue their traditional forms. Houses of Parliament, select committees, cabinet, annual general meetings of companies with shareholders' votes, public inquiries and courts of appeal, local authorities, local authority elections, trusts and boards of governors, the public institutions. I am not for one moment saying that any of these institutions is defunct, and it is true that in extremists, any one of them may rouse itself to put a stop to runaway oligarchs, even to dismiss or disgrace them. But in normal circumstances, they don't often exercise that continuous scrutiny and control which they are allotted in theory. For effective purposes, it is the oligarchs in control. Now, this may seem an extreme statement of position. In any case, is it always such a bad thing? Surely representative democracy does include, and must include, a good deal of latitude for top executives to take decisions properly. But, and on the basis that they simply know more about the situation. They shouldn't be second guessed by ignorant provincials. They must be given space to get on with the job. I think such blind acceptance has been severely shaken by the recent crashes. The space that the managers were allowed to enjoy has proved a pernicious temptation. We begin to ask ourselves, why weren't they stopped in time? Surely the warning signs were there for the supervising bodies to see. Why didn't the checks and balances come into operation? 